she will bring us through a scenario. So cover the mechanics indication and the efforts to that from this presentation. Okay. And then we have another speaker, our special guest, um, is Learn Edward from Edward Shabon uh, from the scientific and MPH. And he's very experienced and can solve a lot of issues uh, with psychotic problems. Okay, so let's learn now. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary, and um, I will talk about the first part about the pharmacotherapy of uh, psychotic disorder. Okay. Uh, so for the for the goal of our treatment, when we treat um, psychosis, of course we want to alleviate the target symptom. That is what we want, and we also want to improve the functionality of the patient so that the patient can go back to normal life and also have a good quality of life. But aside from that, we also want to avoid the side effect. Side effects very important because if a patient suffers from side effects a lot, then he won't want to he won't want to take the medication. And medication won't work if a patient uh, has a poor compliance with the a prescribed regimen. So, uh, so these are what, what 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 we are looking for when we are treating um, psychosis. Okay, and first, um, I will begin with a case scenario. Okay, let's see how the story goes. Okay, today um, there's a, a, a girl uh, named uh, JJ. Okay, she is a 23 years old girl. And uh, one day she was brought to the emergency department by her campus security. And she's a college student because she was running naked, naked through the campus and screaming, oh, there's someone after me and won't leave me alone. Oh, they are t keep telling me to run and hide. Um, however, in the past, um, this girl has never been hospitalized or treated for any uh, psychiatric condition. And uh, her roommate is the one, the person who uh, has living with her uh, in the recent years. And according to what the roommate said, said uh, she used to be quite normal, but since a year ago, she becomes increasingly unusual and erratic. Uh, so now she has auditory hallucination delusions, magical thinking, and she also shows um, conceptual disorganization in her speech and also agitation. And sometimes she also acted out her delusions by getting into arguments with people. She thinks that, oh, the other person might be her enemies. Okay, so it's quite apparent that this patient is suffering from um, psychosis and uh, she is experiencing an acute outbreak. So let's see about the pharmacotherapy. Okay, this is this is the therapy in the acute phase that is recommended by uh, the national treatment, treatment guideline in the Swatini. Okay, in the acute phase, our major target is to uh, relieve the agitation, the the acute symptoms. So here we usually use a short-acting injectables uh, followed by benzodiazepines. And the benzodiazepines we give uh, are also usually given by by um, uh, by IV or IM, okay. And like in the country, we have diazepam and lorazepam. Okay, they are quite similar. However, uh, diazepam has a quicker onset and longer uh, duration of action. And uh, oh yeah, for the short acting inject injectable, we have called peridol clopromazine. And also what, what worth noticing is that uh, because chromazine may lower the seizure threshold, so it is recommended to avoid it in patients with epilepsy. And uh, after the remission of the acute phase, we still have to give medication, the maintenance therapy in order to control. And uh, this is also according to the national treatment guideline. Okay, the guideline says that for the first line therapy, uh, you can use haloperidol, sulpride, or pro, uh, chlorpromazine, the, the oral dosage form. Uh, these agents, these first line therapy, they are also belongs to uh, the first generation, the atypical antipsychotics. Um, they are cheaper in price and also much more widely available. Um, however, they usually have more side effects, okay? 
And uh, for the second life therapy, we have used peridone, olanzapine, and quetiapine uh, in the country. And uh, they also belong to the second generation that are typical antipsychotics. Okay, all right. Okay, now, now let's take a look at the mode of action of uh, antipsychotics. Um, okay, the, the mode of action of the first and the gener second generation antipsychotics are somewhat different. Uh, we can see that for the first generation antipsychotics, it is majorly a, a dopamine 2 receptor antagonist. They have a high affinity for a dopamine, re dopamine 2 receptor. Um, however, for the second generation antipsychotics, um, they also have an affinity for a dopamine receptor, but not that strong. Because aside from dopamine receptor, they also interact, they also block the ser serotonin receptor known as uh, 5-HT2A. Uh, uh -huh. So their mode of action is a little bit different. And um, no matter it's the first or the second generation antipsychotics, uh, they all have some unspecific binding to other receptors such as muscarinic receptor, uh, histamine receptor, or other serotonin receptor, or the alpha-1 uh, adrenergic receptor. And the blocking of these receptors are associated with their side effects. As you can see, if they block the muscarinic receptor, then it will develop anticholinergic side effects. And if they bind to, uh, if they block the histamine receptor, then it will lead to sedation and uh, increased appetite. And also if they uh, block the serotonin uh, 2C receptor, then it will lead to weight gain. And for the adrenergic receptor, it will lead to hypertension. So, that, so the adverse effects of antipsychotics are related, also related to their um, mode of action. <laughs> you can say it this way. Okay, and here's an, another thing about how do these antipsychotics work. Okay, in psychosis, we have the positive and the negative uh, or cognitive symptom. For the, posit uh, for the positive symptoms, uh, they include uh, delusions, hallucinations, hallucination, hyperactivity, agitation, and etc. And the positive, the positive symptoms are associated with the excess release of dopamine uh, at the mesolimbic pathway. So for the uh, antipsychotics, no matter the first or the second generation, by blocking the dopamine receptor here, they can uh, relieve the positive symptoms. So this is how they work. And for the negative symptom and, and the cognitive, cognitive symptoms, it includes like uh, um, psychomotor retardation or depression or yes isolation and also the attentional impairment and these uh, negative and cognitive sim symptoms they are uh, caused by the dopamine deficit at the prefrontal cortex a different region and so what the uh, antipsychotics work is that you can see that for second generation antipsychotics, we have mentioned because they also block the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. And blocking this receptor can increase the dopamine release in the prefrontal cortex. So it can relieve the negative and the cognitive syndromes. Okay, so this is how they work. Uh, so after you understand the mode of action, the next important thing you have to know is uh, side effect because side effects plays a very important role in influencing patient's adherence <clears throat> to the therapy, okay? So oh, let's come back to the scenario again. Actually, this is the same patient. I just, we just continue the story. Okay, let's see. Okay, the, the girl, the patient, uh, during the hosp hospital, hospitalization, she is eventually um, stabilized on using a uh, risperidone 2 mg EZ. Um, however, after discharge, because she is still having some uh, auditory hallucination, even though she is taking her doses, so her doses is increased to 3 mg BB. However, a few weeks later, uh, it is found that um, the patient has a symptom of 
she can bear the roof and uh, she walks like an old lady and she also has some mild uh, stiffness in her extremities and um, she tremor, mild tremor in her hands and also when she walks her steps, her gait is, is abnormally short and almost like shuffling however her hallucination has subsided, subsided. So, what do you think might be the cause of such abnormal neurologic findings? What might be the cause? Because of the antipsychotics, right? Risperidone. Yeah, she's taking risperidone. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, because uh, in order for the antipsychotic agents to have its efficacy, uh, it needs to occupy, needs to block the dopamine 2 receptor. However, if the affinity for dopamine receptor is too strong, then it will increase the risk of getting EPS, as you can see. So that's why. Okay, and this is a very important slide. I summarized the adverse effects profile of uh, some of the very commonly used antipsychotics in this slide. Um, okay, the bottom are the ones at the bottom are the typical antipsychotics and on the top are the atypical one. And you can see that um, for the uh, typical antipsychotics, because they have higher affinity for dopamine receptors, so usually they have higher risk of EPS. Uh, you can see like haloperidol, uh, but uh, for risperidone or other uh, atypical antipsychotics, most of them has a lower risk of EPS, uh, except for risperidone. <laughs> and risperidone still has some risk for EPS. And also, aside from that, you can see um, uh, the first generation antipsychotics, they also have a higher risk of leading to a uh, prolactin elevation yeah, compared mm -hmm. to the atypical antipsychotics. And uh, aside from, however, um, the second generation antipsychotics, the typical antipsychotics, they also have their downside. Uh, we can see that even though they have fewer EPS and prolactin uh, side effects, however, they have higher incidence of um, metabolic syndromes, uh, such as you can see for the newer agent like olanzapine or quetiapine or even clozapine. Oh, we, I think we don't have clozapine in the country now. Um, you can see that they have a higher incidence of uh, weight gain. Oh, this is high. Another word character is a bit small. This is hyperglycemia and dyslipidemia. Oh, so that that is also why um, patients who are using a typical antipsychotics they may have higher risk of uh, type two DM or dyslipidemia. And also uh, some second generation antipsychotics like. Uh, or lanzapine or clozapine, they also have a strong sedative or anticholinergic side effect. Okay, and here are the other star, other even newer agents. Um, we may not have have this them in the country. However, uh, on the global market, we uh, now uh, many countries are using agents such as uh, repripazole or ziprosidone. Yeah, they are even newer, uh, atypical antipsychotics. Okay. And uh, so, how do we manage EPS? Uh, there are several strategies, okay? Uh, of course, you can think about oh, whether to lower the dose of the antipsychotics. However, if you lower the dose, then you will put the patient, you may put the patient at a risk of relapse. Okay, so that's what you have to think about. And aside from that, uh, switching to other anti and psychotics, usually the atypical ones uh, with the lower risk of EPS, might also be an option. And aside from that, uh, you can also use medications to treat uh, EPS, such as in the countries, uh, we are using biperidin, the anticholinergic agents, biperidin and uh, trihexaphenidyl uh, to treat or to prevent uh, EPS. Okay, then we come back to the scenario again. Okay, the story continues. Okay, so finally, the patient's uh, drug-induced Parkinsonism resolves with the addition of biperidin. However, over time, 
um, because there is still some lingering symptoms, so the dose of risperidone is increased to 4 mg BD. Um, however, uh, uh, however, later on, um, the, the patient says that, oh, she, she feels that uh, she's pregnant because she hasn't had her uh, menstrual period for nearly two months. And she also said that her breast has become larger and that she also lactates uh, periodically. And uh, so a pregnancy blood test is conducted. However, the result comes back negative. But her, ser her serum prolactin level is as high as 115 nanograms per mil. Okay, the normal range is below about 25. Yeah, so what, what do you think might be the cause of this one? Yeah, be also because of the drug. Yes. So, yeah, so protein uh, uh, prolactin elevation is another important side effect of the antipsychotics because of blocking the dopamine receptor. And uh, hyperprolactinemia, mm, it will inhibit um, the release, the production of uh, sexual hormones. So it may lead to like uh, interfering the ovulation or amenorrhea or osteoporosis or even sexual dysfunction. And uh, it may also cause like lactating and the enlargement of breast uh, in males. Okay, so how do we manage prolactinemia? Okay, there are also several strategies like lower the dose or switch to another antipsychotics. Yes, they are the strategies that you can consider. Okay, and aside from that, if a patient really needs other medication, you may also give some weak dopamine, dopaminergic agonist, um, such as amantadine. Okay, and also some recent data evidence have shown that metformin can help uh, to, to uh, lower the prolactin level in such situation. Okay, <laughs> let's go come back to the scenario again. So now um, the patient changed the medication. She stopped, use, she stopped using a risperidone and now she starts to use olanzapine. Uh, however, after two months of using starting olanzapine, uh, the patient complains that she's always eating and uh, she didn't fit into her clothes Yeah, because she gains weight. Okay, and her, you can see that now her BMI is also above the normal range, 25.9, okay? Uh, however, the patient is currently doing well on the medication. There's no psychotic symptoms. Mm, so what do you think might be the cause? Olanzapine, right? Because, yes, olanzapine has the, as we have mentioned, Olanzapine has this metabolic syndrome side effect. It may cause uh, the patient to gain weight. So usually uh, what we can do is, first we will recommend the patient to have a dietary restriction and encourage the patient to exercise regularly. Mm, however, if the weight gain is, if the, if the patient still gains too much weight, then you can also consider switching to another antipsychotics. Okay. Okay. The story continues. Okay. So this patient is still using olanzapine, and one month later, um, the patient uh, uh, got a, a blood test, and the blood test shows that her fasting serum glucose is two uh, fourteen. So that's yeah, that's quite high. And uh, also, it's incre it has increased. And also, her HbA1c uh, has also increased to 7.1% uh, over this time. And for her cholesterol, her cholesterol now is 256. Uh, even though LDL is fine, but, uh, but HDL is a bit low, it's 34. And her triacylglyceride oh, is high, it's 997. Okay, so do you think the changes are related to the medication? Yes, yes, it is related to, it may related to uh, olanzapine. So how, how can we manage? 
um, usually at this time we can give medication for the treatment of like hyperglycemia or dyslipidemia. However, if the situation is too serious, too severe, then we can consider uh, switching to another antipsychotics. Okay. And uh, okay, the story continues. Um, so because of the weight gain and the worsening of the glucose and lipid profiles, now the patient finally changed to change the drug, change to another drug. She stopped using Olanzan and then start to use another antipsychotic. Okay, we don't mention we, we, the, the story didn't mention yeah which antipsychotic she starts to use now. Um, however, the point is that now the patient because she has been suffering from uh, uh, adverse effects so much, so now she's fearful of experiencing adverse effects again. So now the patient uh, refuses to take any antipsychotic. So it's apparent that the patient is having poor adherence to the medication. So what do you think you can do for poor adherence? Uh, long injectables, mm -hmm. long acting injectables. Yes, that would be a good solution. Yes, we can use long acting injectable antipsychotics. We also have them in the country. It's a good option for patients like this, poor adherence to the therapy, because it can decrease the dosing frequency. Uh, unlike the oral form, uh, you need to take it every day or twice a day. Um, this one, you can take it every several weeks or even several months <laughs> in some cases. Okay. And uh, however, if you use long acting injectables, um, you need a stabilization phase to convert from oral dosage form to the long-acting injectable form. And sometimes in the conversion phase, you will even have to overlap the medications. Okay, and uh, usually we will give a long injectable uh, antipsychotics um, of a of the same ingredient as the oral dosage <coughs> form if it's available. Okay, uh, and the long acting injectable uh, also it doesn't has any it doesn't has much greater risk for adverse effect if except for the uh, injection site irritation. Uh, however there's also also the downside. The downside is that because the half-life of the long-acting injectable is longer. So it may also take time for the medication to reach a steady state concentration. So what it means is that it will be less efficient to uh, adjust the dose or managing adverse effect if a patient is using this one. Okay, and this is also adopted from the treatment national treatment guideline in the country. Now we have the first line uh, long acting antipsychotics such as flubenfixone. <clears throat> uh, this one is useful, also useful for negative symptoms. And we also have zucropenfixone and also flufenazine. Flufenazine uh, is good for positive symptoms. And for the second line, we have risperidone. Risperidone is also also being made into the injectable forms. Uh, and usually when we give the long-acting injectables, um, we, will, we will use uh, anticholinergic agents to uh, prevent or to cope or to cope with the EPS uh, adverse effect. Okay, and uh, are this, these are some other agents that are widely available uh, in the global market aside from what we have mentioned. Because now we also have, on the global market, we also have like coloperidol, olanzapine, aripriprazole, or uh, these agents are also being made into the long-acting injectables. Okay, uh, here's another agent that I would like to mention, even though we don't have now in the country, a uh, clozapine. Uh, this agent is quite special. You, you may be using it one day in the, in the near future. Okay. It is a very effective for treatment resistant schizophrenia. Mm, however, 
uh, okay, and it is it is also a drug of choice for severe suicidality and uh, aggressive behavior, and also a very good benefit of this one is it induces uh, fewer EPS. So that's a good point about glucosamine. However, the downside is that uh, the glucosamine has many adverse effects, uh, and some of them are quite dangerous, like the ones I'm. Uh, highlight them in red. Uh, the uh, granulocytosis seizures. Uh, it is for seizure. It it is usually dose dependent and myocarditis and orthostatic hypertension. So uh, but and also metabolic syndromes. Yeah, it also causes metabolic syndrome. And still other uh, adverse effects include um, some of the not very dangerous but can be very bothersome side effects such as constipation or urinary incontinence uh, due to the alpha uh, receptor blockage and also excessive drooling. Yeah, they are quite bothersome. Okay, so if you give close up, you remember to monitor uh, closely uh, to ensure safety and efficacy. Okay, I think this is the last slide, my part. Uh, consideration in pregnancy and lactation. Okay, using uh, using antipsychotics in pregnancy and lactation is always a very mm, very difficult to handle problem issue. Okay, um, and the situation is that um, mm, the data on the safety of antipsychotics uh, during pregnancy are quite limited um, because it is difficult to conduct. A well designed and prospective clinical trials for pregnant women because they will, it will involve some ethical issues. Mm. So, we are always trying to strike a balance between the risk and the benefits. Uh, okay, but you still have to treat the patient for psychosis because if you left the patient, the mother, untreated, then it will, it will put both the mother and the children, the fetus, at, the, at risk. Because the pa the patient, the mother won't be able to engage in self care and prenatal care. And uh, okay, so what are the risks of antipsychotics in uh, this group of patients? Okay, let's see. Uh, the antipsychotics may increase the risk of preterm birth. Uh, this one is, is 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 especially prominent for the first generation antipsychotics, and for the second generation. Um, it will be gestational DM. Yeah, we have mentioned that second generation uh, may lead to metabolic side effect, and also antipsychotics may appear in the breast milk, so it can pass to the children. Okay, and uh, also it is found that for mother who is taking medication in the third trimester, it may also pose a risk. For EPS and withdrawal sim uh, symptoms in the newborns, uh, so what what can we do? Okay, okay, so you need to be very careful. Um, always uh, evaluate carefully and select appropriate treatment based on the efficacy and the safety of the medication uh, on on your patient. And also, usually mono monotherapy is preferred because. Uh, the less drug you take, then the lower incidence of the side effect. Okay, and also medications with fewer interactions uh, or higher protein binding. Higher protein binding means that uh, if a drug binds more to protein like albumin, then there will be fewer uh, free drugs in the blood circulation. So that it will have a less unwanted side effects. So these kind of uh, antipsychotics are preferred. Okay. Okay. This is the end of this part. And thank you.